Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 129, Dusting Off the Old Favorites. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my dedicated and talented co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? Kind of awake, but not really. We'll take kind of. <laughs> that's, that's better than average, I think, on most yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been a long couple of weeks. It has. We were off last week, right? Right. And then we had a long weekend this weekend. Right. Our last band competition. Yes, we are officially done with this season of marching band. Yes, we are. So we will kind of kind of take some time and enjoy it and right. What's it start up again in March, I think? Uh, maybe. Probably. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. So. Sooner than, than we probably expected. We have a little uh, we have a little time a off. A little so. a little reprieve. And and really we're not the ones that are you know, it, it's we're more the the back and forth Correct. getting her there. Correct. So, you know, it's a well deserved break for for her and, and all the other kids. That Although I, I do have to say I was kind of surprised at the amount of uh, interaction on the parents. Mm-hmm. And it was more than I, I had originally expected. Well, and, and not to, to really get into this because it just so happens that next week That's true, on yes. Insights into Teens, you're going to be doing a podcast about marching band. And as I was kind of briefly explaining to somebody i said it's it's as rigorous as a sport because there's so much involved with practice and things like that but when you go to competitions and do things it's very much a family yes it's it's a very supportive community right amongst other bands like you have rivals but there isn't a rivalry atmosphere right it's like oh i want to do better than them but when they go on, you still cheer just yep, as loud. Yep. And Even when the bands were coming off, you had the band that was right. coming off was wishing the, the band coming on, you know, good, good luck, luck, guys, good, and right. have a good time. Right. You know. Where when you go to a sporting event, the two football teams or the two soccer teams, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. where, you know, that was probably the best part of this last competition was one of the moms of one of our seniors She's all cheering, come on, Cookie, you know, and then, and it was just so infectious yep. that yep. parents from a rival school were like, oh my God, we got to cheer for yeah, them give, too. Give, just give her a hand. You they, know, they win just on team spirit. Exactly. So it, it's, it, it is, we didn't know how <clears throat> much more it was yeah. going to be involved. So we need a, a break too, yeah. <laughs> you know, so from, be, from all of it uh, as well. So we'll be enjoying the downtime, but yes, next week we'll have a, uh, yeah, that's special should be guest a good one. on Insights into Teens, and we'll go into it in a lot more so detail. So there's our little plug for for next week's uh, episode go. for you guys. But obviously, that is not what we're talking nope. about this week. Not at all. Today in our Disney Detective, Wonder Woman and the Evil Queen, and can the Main Street Electrical Parade solve Disney's problems again? Probably not. No. <laughs> then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. An unnecessary origin story for an irrelevant character. It's the camera. The camera's overheating is what it is. Oh, is that what that is? That's what the beep is, and it changes the camera angle here, so I have to figure out what I'm going to do to cool that off. Okay. Uh, Anyway, in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, an unnecessary origin story for an irrelevant character, plus is there an Old Republic movie in the works? And for our entertainment news... Netflix may be coming to Jersey and the unfortunate passing of Dean Stockwell. 
And as always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and a few dwindling list of afterthoughts. Uh, ready to get into it? Sure, let's do this. All right. Before we start, though, I would invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe to the video version of this podcast listed as Insights into Things. Uh, the audio version of the podcast can be found listed as Insights into Entertainment. Um, we are available on Google, Apple, Stitcher, Amazon, pretty much any place you can get a podcast these days. We would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback, tell us how we're doing, give us some show suggestions, give us some of your conventions that we can plug. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We are on Twitter at twitter.com slash insights underscore things. On Facebook, you can get us at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast on Instagram. We're at insights into things. We can get links to all those on our website at insights into things.com. Shall we get started? Sure. All right, here we go. Go for something that I did not push the button for on this side here because I haven't done this in so long. <laughs> Go for Disney detective. <laughs> so it seems that Wonder Woman's Gal Gadot will be playing one of the all-time greatest Disney villains in an upcoming remake. So back in June, it was announced that Disney's upcoming live-action remake of Snow White had found its star to play the title lead, as the production hired Rachel uh, Zegler to play the beloved princess. Now, her name might sound a little bit familiar because she's going to be playing Maria in the upcoming adaptation of West Side Story. So the actor had spent months, um, had spent the months since then as the only member of the cast, but now that has changed with a ma in a major way. As the news broke that uh, Gal Gadot had come aboard uh, the upcoming blockbuster to play the role of the evil queen, the Hollywood Reporter had shared the latest update about the Disney production, which has amazing Spider-Man director Mark Webb at the helm. The film marks the second time that Gal has been part of the project, um, has been part of a project at that studio as she previously voiced a character in 2018's Ralph Breaks the Internet. So known for her spectacularly intense vanity, the evil queen in The Tale of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is famous for her regular check-ins with her magic mirror, requesting affirmation that she is the fairest of them all. When her enchanted looking glass one day returns the unfortunate news that the story's uh, protagonist has her beat in the looks department, the wicked royal makes plans to kill her, though those obviously don't quite work out as it's planned. So Gal Gadot will be the third actress in the past, uh, in the last decade to m take on the role of the evil queen in Snow White in a motion picture, uh, though her portrayal will be the first to specifically be based on the classic version of the character from the animated Disney film in 1937. Charlize Theron had played the part uh, named Ravina in 2012's Snow White and the Huntsman, starring opposite Chris Kristen Stewart. Later that same year, Julia Roberts played the queen in Mirror Mirror with Lily Collins. And not to, uh, to, to forget about another evil queen, one of our favorites who played the evil queen from television in Once Upon a Time was uh, Lana Perella. Um, so it should be a cool opportunity for Gal as a number of big stars have made an impression, uh, had made an impression playing live action Disney villains in the past couple of years. Most notably Angelina Jolie as Maleficent, Emma Stone as Cruella de Vil, Kate Blanchett as the wicked stepmother in Cinderella. So with the production on Mark Webb's Snow White not set to start up until next year, it's probably going to be a while before fans actually get to see her in action as the evil queen. But 
obviously there's some good news as well because she has a couple of other movies coming out beforehand. Um, so Red Notice, which uh, co-stars Dwayne Johnson and Ryan Reynolds, will arrive on Netflix actually this Friday. And Death on the Nile, which is the sequel to Murder on the Orient Express, is scheduled to hit theaters uh, February of 2022. Very cool. And I think that's probably one of my favorite and I don't know why, but it's one of my favorite Disney princess movies. Okay. And I think it's because it's such a good villain part. Mm, yeah. You know, it's a it's a it's a good villain part that's not like a supernatural style, you know, right. dragon True. type thing. And it's just such a the the evilness is so it's it's rooted in human nature. Okay. I can um, see that. It, it's it's not like some artificial evil that comes out of it that's you know it's it's almost like you can see a real person being like that mm. uh, so that's kind of something that always compelled me about that particular character but mm -hmm. i think gal gadot is going to do a fantastic job yeah in, it'll be weird to see her in as a bad guy as a bad guy because yeah. you know she's wonder woman yeah she can't be bad yeah. But I could definitely see her playing, you know, like I'm the fairest of them all and da 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 and, you know, being that vain sure, yeah. character that, that, you know, the it'll evil be, queen it'll is. It'll be interesting seeing her in a non-action role. Mm. Uh, I can't, I can't see her throwing too many people through walls and stuff like that right. in this role. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, could, I could see that not being, you know, the yeah. thing. So, so I, I, I think she's going to. She's going to knock it out of the park. Mm -hmm. What else did we have? So uh, so Disneyland, it seems, is bringing back the Main Street electric Electrical Parade, and some say it's too small of a goodwill gesture. So the optics for the recent developments of Disneyland have not been pretty lately. So you have the sold-out Magic Key annual passes. You have the parking price hikes. You have a new high priced ever ticket for the most in demand days like holidays. And then you have at least two more months without parking trams. And that's just been the last couple of weeks. But there's one, I guess, bright spot literally is that the main street electrical parade appears to be coming back to the park soon. So the iconic and much beloved parade started at Disneyland in 1972 and ran through 1996 and features what's believed to be approximately 500,000 light bulbs on its floats, which depict iconic scenes from movies like Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland. Now, according to the Disney blog, allears.net, when it was retired, the parade had been performed almost 3,600 times for more than 75 million guests. Disney had hinted at the parade's return on a TikTok earlier this week with a video of a sparkling snail, which happened to be one of the electrical parade's floats, heading towards a Disneyland truck, followed by a message, To Be Continued. So fans on social media have been positive, um, and many have been wondering whether it's a move designed to sort of have some goodwill towards the company in the midst of such a prolonged bad news cycle, including an ongoing lawsuit which has 25,000 cast members uh, that are suing Disneyland over a living wage. Um, so one person had tweeted, there are few guarantees in life, but Disney trotting out the Main Street Electrical Parade whenever they're having some sort of trouble at the California parks is one of them. So the move wouldn't be without precedent. So it seems that Disneyland has a history of using this parade to kind of smooth over rough patches at the park. When the park retired the parade in 1996, the company used the idea that it was the last chance to see it before and basically to try and boost attendance and profits. And then in 20, uh, 2001, it brought back the then retired parade to Disney California Adventures to combat a lackluster attendance numbers that were at that park. And there it became known as Disney's Electrical Parade since the park didn't have a main street. So they had said, Disney's California Adventure, um, 
I'm sorry, they said uh, Disney's California Adventure had opened in February 2001, um, which came, which was quoted from the Disneyland history blog Yesterland. Um, and they said when expected attendance lever- levels failed to materialize, the park had a quick, went into quick action. And the first thing that they did was they brought back the parade. So they said if killing the parade could work such wonders, how about just bring it back from the dead? So although the parade was popular enough to be kept around for several years at California Adventure, it didn't solve the underlining issues with the park. If the parade was meant to provide an instant fix to the park's attendance problems, it it failed. So the parade, you know, made some reappearances in 2017 and then 2019. So considering that the Walt Disney Company's enormous year-over-year profit and the launch of paid fast passes earlier this month, some Disney fans have noted that this parade, using equipment that existed for nearly 50 years and requires no real investment of time or finances that a new show would demand, feels convenient. One person had said, Is this the new and inexpensive way to get a parade going? Then somebody else said, Y'all made your customers angry, so you got to drag this out again? Hmm? And finally, somebody said, I'm in the most toxic, abusive relationship ever with Disney. Raise prices, but wait, I love you. Here's Main Street Electrical Parade. <laughs> you know, it's it's good to see that I'm not the only one that sees these. Mm-hmm. I'll even go so far as to say villainous acts by Disney. Right. Right, um, and then and then it's it's these kind of half attempts at trying to resolve things when the the root of the problem is you need to fix the other problem. Right. You need to stop stealing money from people, and right. you need to fix the problems that are going on in your parks. Right, and not like oh, we'll throw this parade at you, or we'll throw this snack at you, right. or we'll throw. You know, this at you to make up for and the, you all know, this other stuff. The, the one fan that pointed out the fact that basically you're throwing something at us that doesn't require you to invest any money in anything. And you're still raking in profits that are ridiculously above what mm-hmm. they should be. It's, you know, this is another sign that, that Disney under the current leadership mm-hmm. is going in the wrong direction. Yep. And... The more stories like this I see, the less inclined I am to go to a Disney park. I know. So they don't need my money. I, I've got plenty of other ways to spend it besides giving it to someone who doesn't need it. Yeah. Sad but true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unfortunately. So that was all we had for our Disney detective this mm-hmm. week. Uh, we'll be back in a brief moment with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. <laughs> For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. From our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Star Wars reveals the full origin story for Supreme Leader Snoke. And no one cares. (laughs) It's been almost two years since the finale to the Skywalker saga, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, debuted in theaters. J.J. Abrams' movie, for some fans, further tarnished the reputation of the Star Wars franchise leading to a call for a rewrite of the entire sequel trilogy. While some praise the reprisal of the villain Emperor Palpatine 
a.k.a. Darth Sidious, played by Ian McDermott, others saw it as a complete U-turn on the sequel's sequel trilogy's direction, especially after Ryan Johnson's disaster of a movie, Star Wars The Last Jedi, killed off its antagonist, Supreme Leader Snoke. Now Star Wars was given an in-depth account of Snoke's origin, which no one cares about. Supreme Leader Snoke, played by Andy Serkis, first appeared in Disney and Lucasfilm's first Star Wars venture, Star Wars The Force Awakens in 2015, as the leader of the First Order, alongside General Hux, played by Domhnall Gleeson, and Master of Kylo Ren, portrayed by Adam Driver. It was Johnson's sequel, that disaster of a movie, that flipped the franchise on its head after killing Snoke with a lightsaber and teaming up Ren and Daisy Ridley's Rey in an impressive battle sequence. This shocking moment was just one of the many, many polarizing parts of the sequel trilogy's sophomoric and sophomore Star Wars movie. The Star Wars galaxy hasn't really been the same since that disaster. Projects like showrunner Jon Favreau and executive producer Dave Filoni's The Mandalorian have started to stitch the fandom back together, with new adventures happening somewhat separately from the franchise's trilogies. Which, to be honest with you, if I had a project with Star Wars, I wouldn't want to be associated with the sequel trilogy right now either. One contentious part of the saga, though, is still plot holes and retcons of The Rise of Skywalker. Star Wars often uses multimedia to further explore and explain events in the movies. Just recently, they announced a brand new Luke Skywalker project set in between uh, Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens, which is said to include elements of the Sith Order and Exegol, that planet no one ever heard about until Rise of Skywalker, and they had to kind of invent the planet to try to fix the problems. You know, it was the Sith hideaway featured in Rise of Skywalker, where Palpatine was located with some mysteriously created fleet that they never really explained, and a bunch of shadow guys in the stands that did nothing while Palpatine was slaughtered, and all kinds of really crazy, questionable <laughs> things from that movie. True. Now, Star Wars has revealed more detailed a more detailed account of Palpatine's cloning process on Exegol, the Sith eternal and how he managed to coordinate his return to power and control the first order for context it was only a few months ago that star wars quietly confirmed that snoke was quote an evil duplicate of palpatine for the first time in canon star wars fans can rejoice as more information has come to light surrounding the duplicate villain which no one cares about <laughs> Thanks to Jacob's Quest on Twitter, who has shared excerpts from the new book, Star Wars Secrets of the Sith, we now know the full origin story of Supreme Leader Snoke, and still don't care. We can see from the information here, and straight from the source too, that this Star Wars book, Secrets of the Sith, is narrated by Palpatine himself, and that Snoke was a temporary measure at best. The excerpt part of Snoke's backstory reads, should I do it in voice? It's entirely up to you. My new body's deformities were severe. Unable to leave Exegol. I would have, st I would have to spend... See, I can't, I can't do it and read the lines, too. That's my problem. I'm so sorry. Unable to leave Exegol, I would have to spread my influence across the galaxy through less direct means. As part of their genetic experiments, my followers had attempted to create another being that came to be known as Snoke. Although his body proved unworthy of containing my dark essence, Snoke's natural sensitivity to the Force would make him a powerful puppet nonetheless. Through my manipulation of Snoke, I began gathering forces building an army capable of opposing the new republic that had risen in my absence. Through Snoke, I would make certain that the First Order would be mine to control. End quote. Palpatine's dec uh, declaration that Snoke was a, quote, temporary measure, 
is sure to take on a rather meta meaning for Star Wars fans, as the sequel trilogy's muddled storyline perfectly demonstrated what, quote, temporary means. Mark Samaric's Secrets of the Sith also recently gave fans their first canon look at Sheev Palpatine's master, Darth Plagueis, in a new image featuring Darth Sidious and Darth Vader. The section goes on to discuss Palpatine's son and how this cloned subject eventually led him to the heir to the Empire, his granddaughter Rey. Many fans will know the outcome of Rey's discovery of Palpatine, her forced dyad with Ben Solo, a.k.a. Kylo Ren, and the reasoning behind her abandonment on the planet Jakku that nobody goes to anymore. The conclusion was cluttered with unwarranted reveals, but at least now, fans can rest easy knowing the full thought process behind the creation of Supreme Leader Snoke, at least from Palpatine's perspective. Oh, thank goodness we know now. Because it makes that movie make so much more sense now that I know that. I kind of sense a little bit of sarcasm. A little bit. Just a little I'm bit. not really sure. Okay, just making sure. Ostensibly, Star Wars has been hinting at Palpatine's survival and his cloning experiments in both The Mandalorian, through the inclusion of Grogu and Dr. Pershing's mysterious infatuation with him, and Filoni's The Bad Batch. The latter saw the Star Wars Legends location of Mount Tantus appear, which has ties to Emperor Palpatine and to Grand Admiral Thrawn's cloning program. And this kind of brings me back to what we had been talking about for quite some time now, and that's the fact that they had the entire storyline laid out Mm -hmm. in a nice, neat trilogy that... um, uh, Oh... Who wrote it? The Thrawn trilogy. Uh, Timothy Zahn. Right. Timothy Zahn's trilogy of uh, Thrawn and the return of the Emperor and the cloning and all that stuff. It was the perfect sequel trilogy. And when Disney came in with their strong arm tactics, they declared all that stuff is not real. And we're going to make it up as we go along. And they screwed it up royally. Mm-hmm. And now they're going back to all that original material and slowly bringing it back in. Right, because they realize they made a huge mistake right, just, and they need to fix it. You know what? Man up, throw mm-hmm. out that steaming pile of crap that is the sequel trilogy, pretend that that's non canon. Right. And then bring in Timothy Zahn to write the new trilogy and just do it, do it right mm-hmm. and make everybody's world. Um, anyway, so we, we know Thrawn's, uh, we know, uh, uh, Snoke. Snoke's origin and it doesn't make me care about him or the, the movies or the characters anymore. It, it makes no sense. They're, they're desperately trying to justify the shortcuts and the disaster that they took. And, and the sad thing is they started out pretty strong with force awakens and they could have really done something with mm-hmm. it. And then Ryan Johnson, they, for some reason they let Ryan Johnson literally just come in and flush the entire sequence, the entire series, down the toilet. And nobody at Disney did anything to stop him from doing that? Yeah, that's kind of surprising. Like, when you every executive it. who made the decision to not make a decision on that should have been fired. And you should have threw the movie out before it even hit the press, before it even came out, and started over again and just bit the bullet on it. Instead, you wasted a whole nother movie trying to retcon that, right, and that turned everything. out to be a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, poor J.J., who's a very talented individual mm-hmm. himself, wound up taking heat for trying to clean up to try and fix it, yeah. Ryan Johnson's mess. Yeah. <sighs> anyway. You feel I, better? You not not really. I, I actually feel much worse now that I <laughs> went through that rant. Because usually I, I rant on... Uh, Disney. Disney and not Star Wars. Mm. But anyway, there is a silver lining in the works here. Is there? There is. Why don't you tell us about it? Let me tell you about it. So did Star Wars, the old Republic uh, movie, did a Star Wars old Republic movie replace Rogue Squadron? Well, Den of Geek seems to think so. The big Star Wars news this week, Rogue Squadron, the movie, helmed by Wonder Woman director Patty Jenkins, has been delayed 
from its 2023 release date. The Hollywood Reporter reports, because that's what Hollywood Reporter does, they report. Is it? That Jenkins' other commitments, including Wonder Woman 3, will prevent her from being able to film the first post-Skywalker saga Star Wars movie next year. That's too many S's in a row there. Since this was the only upcoming Star Wars film with a confirmed release date, this is now this now potentially leaves the franchise's theatrical side in limbo. Which in reality is not that big a deal because their television site on Disney Plus is running so strong now and they got so many projects going on. So I'm not overly concerned about the franchise. As long as they don't put Ryan Johnson back in charge of anything. Okay, Uh, but if another rumor that spread through social media over the past few days is to be believed, there may be more to this delay than meets the eye, and no, it's not Transformers. On Friday, Twitter user Big Screen Leaks, who has recently scooped details about upcoming Marvel and Star Wars releases, claimed that a new Star Wars movie would film in 2022, but not with that angry camera that keeps beeping. And it wasn't a project announced at Disney's Investors Day broadcast last year. Uh, Adam Frazier at Slash Film retweeted and responded to Big Screen League's claim with his own cryptic message suggesting that the unannounced movie would be set during the Old Republic era before the events of the Skywalker saga. The Hollywood Reporter confirmed that Rogue Squadron would no longer be shooting next year. As yet, no major news outlets have confirmed the rumors of the Old Republic movie. However, this isn't the first time we've heard that Lucasfilm is making an Old Republic movie. In 2019, BuzzFeed reported that Lucasfilm was developing a Knights of the Old Republic movie. The report followed Lucasfilm President Kathleen Kennedy's own acknowledgement that the studio was thinking of how to do more Knights of the Old Republic. Kennedy said in an interview at the time, Yes, we are developing something to look at. Right now I have no idea where things might fall, but we have to be careful that there's a cadence to Star Wars that doesn't start to feel like too much. That was before 12 more television shows were announced, obviously. (laughs) Lucasfilm has yet to officially confirm that an Old Republic movie is in development. Could this turn out to be part of one of Ryan Johnson's long-lost trilogy of Star Wars movies that was announced in 2017? God, I hope not. Fortunately for Star Wars fans, he's busy with his Knives Out sequels for Netflix. The pace at which things seem to be moving for the galaxy far, far away right now is at least compelling and making the lead up to all the Disney Plus Day news much more exciting. We'll know what's in store on Friday at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, as we record Wednesday of this week right now, uh, which is when Disney plans to drop all of its big updates on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So what do you think? I mean, you're not that big on the Old Republic side of things. Right, but I think there are enough people out there. There's enough of a fan base that could definitely make it worth its while. Um, you know, you have the games that that are are part of that, and and the books and the stories and and other things like that. And I think this kind of goes along with what you've been saying for a very long time: is that they need to step away from the Skywalker storyline of things like that and that you you saw with the mandalorian that you can do it and be very successful with it so you don't have to do a solo story you don't have to do you know all these different backstories to be successful you know people want to see there's a lot of stories out there so there's a lot out there so could this be the turning point that they kind of needed um, you know, because everybody else is busy doing other things and, you know, maybe they've had this script and now, you know, kind of comes well, to. And the other interesting thing is they recently announced that they're re-releasing the Knights of the Old Republic. Okay. Uh, the video game. Mm-hmm. So that's getting a remake itself. It's okay. a fantastic story. It's a story that's carried through two sequels of video games and into an online MMO. 
It has several novels associated with it, a whole series of novels associated with Mm -hmm. it. So there's a ton of story to work with. Maybe this is uh, Disney realizing the error of their ways of let's stop trying to reinvent the wheel. Let's work with the material that we have and enhance it. Now, also, what about Taika Waititi's Star Wars? Is this maybe part of it? Like, we really don't know much of his Star Wars movie sure, that, that's yeah. supposed to be coming out. So, you know, maybe And he was already, that's... you know, reportedly shooting locations, finding, uh, you know, scouting, scouting locations. Scouting locations. So, I don't know, maybe kind of combination of, of everything. I, I think know. I think it's good news if they go in this direction. Um, and hopefully after we start, because Sunday we're scheduled to start our next uh, role-playing session, mm-hmm. which is going to be a yep. Star Wars role-playing that is set in the Old Republic with some original storyline that I wrote there. So hopefully it might even, you know, you might even start to get into it a little bit. There you go. So, but there's a, there's an entire galaxy, literally a galaxy and thousands of years of history to play with here. Right. Why do they keep playing in the same sandbox? It blows my mind. How many stories can you set on Tatooine? How many movies can go to Tat? Like there's like billions of planets in the galaxy. People use them. Anyway. And that has been our Star Wars rant for the day. (laughs) That's it for our uh, Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll be back in a moment with our entertainment news of the week. There's a button here somewhere. There it is. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So it seems that Netflix is looking to acquire an old army base in New Jersey and turn it into a large production facility for film and TV projects. The streaming company will bid on a 289-acre chunk of Fort Monmouth, a 96-year-old army base that closed in 2011. The property is about 50 miles south of New York City, And the facility would be one of Netflix's largest in the U.S., second only to its hub in New Mexico, according to the New York Times, which which reported on the plans earlier this week. So unlike most of its rivals, Netflix doesn't actually own a large Los Angeles studio and has leased or acquired production space all over the world as it has scaled up production. So the company opened a facility in New York earlier this year, but the New Jersey space would dwarf that. So the bidding process actually opened on October 16th and runs through early next year, Netflix has said. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy has been courting Hollywood studios for a couple of years, pitching his state as a business-friendly alternative to production hotspots like Georgia and New York. America's first movie studio was in New Jersey, and today it's home to many talented people working in the entertainment. In entertainment, Netflix had said in a statement, Governor Murphy and the state's legislative leaders have created a business environment that's welcomed film and television productions back to the state, and we're excited to submit our bid to transform Fort Monmouth into a state-of-the-art production facility. I think that's actually kind of cool. Yeah, I think it is. It'd be nice to see, because there's, you know, we have a couple of 
well, there's a lot of military bases that were shut down around, mm-hmm. shut down around the country. It's nice to see people be able to go in and reuse these. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The only concern that I have, and, and this is one that, that companies have run into uh, repeatedly with these older military bases, and that's hazardous material remediation. Mm. You know, you've got a lot of, like, this is almost 100 years old. Right. You know, you've got a lot of lead paint. You've got a lot of asbestos. asbestos you've got right. a lot of chemicals that were used here that may have been stored in tanks that are leaking and stuff. Mm-hmm. I can't only help but wonder what kind of problems they're going to run into here and who's going to pay for it. Right. You know, I could see Murphy basically giving away the, the farm here and, and paying for all that remediation just to bring them in. Mm-hmm. And then what kind of bottom line does the state see? Right, right. Um, yeah, but, I, that's true. But either way, I think it's encouraging to, to see that, that one, Netflix is looking in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, cause it, it's, you know, the story's right. We, New Jersey was where the first movie studios were for Thomas Edison. Yep. Uh, it wasn't until the 1920s or so before everyone moved out to California because of the weather. Right. So Yeah, that's really the biggest thing, but you have so much land where you could build sound stages sure. and things like that, so you don't have to worry about Well and you look at the you know, the article mentions Georgia being mm-hmm. a, a, oh, yeah. a, a spot. You know, I mean you've got so many productions that are mm-hmm. happening in Georgia now. You've got uh the studios for Walking Dead purchased a huge amount of land down there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I've no idea what they're gonna be doing once the once show once the show ends, ends. yeah. Uh, I assume that some other studio is probably going to pick all that stuff up. Yeah, but you figure this is land that's not being used for anything. Right. You might as well put some investment in to, to redevelop it versus building someplace where you have to tear down. Well, and know. I'd rather see a new, fresh industry come into mm-hmm. the state than turn it into condos right. or a shopping mall or right. something like that. Yeah, because how many defunct shopping malls do exactly. we have all over the place? So, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think bringing that kind of industry here to New Jersey is good for everybody, mm-hmm. especially when you're that close to New York. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's good news. What mm-hmm. else do we have? So we had some sad news that was reported uh, yesterday, actually. Um, so Quantum Leap's Quantum Leap actor Dean Stockwell had passed away at age 85. Um, Actor Dean Stockwell, known for his roles in Quantum Leap and Blue Velvet, had passed away. He was 85 years old, and according to a family spokesman, he died of natural causes at his home in Hollywood, California, on Sunday morning. So born Robert Dean Stockwell, the Academy Award nominee, had multiple careers in acting. He actually had started as a child actor. Uh, at age seven, he was working alongside Frank Sinatra and Gene Kelly in Anchors Away. By the time he was 11, he had a star-making role in the 1948 anti-war film The Boy with Green Hair. The movie turned Stockwell into somewhat of a star, and he felt kind of ostracized. He had said in an interview, Wherever I went, I was treated as something different. I didn't feel marked for something special. I felt like I was being treated as something special then, and I didn't like it, and I wanted to get out of it. After he graduated high school at age 16, he changed his name and left Hollywood. He eventually found his way back into acting, notably in Cindy, uh, in Sidney uh, Lamette's Long Day's Journey into Night, from 1962, but spent the majority of the stretch of his career in television. By the late 60s, he once again dropped out of acting for a few years, and when he returned, he found work was hard to get. Then he changed careers altogether in the 1980s. He got his real estate license in New Mexico and ran an ad for himself in Variety. Instead, that led to a string of memorable movie roles in... Wim uh, Wenders' Paris, Texas, David Lynch's Dune and Blue Velvet, Robert Altman's The Player, and Jonathan Demme's Married to the Mob, and the last, which actually netted him an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor. Stockwell was perhaps best known for his role as Admiral Al Calvarici on the sci-fi television series Quantum Leap, which ran for five seasons. 
He'd go on to do other roles in TV shows as the Tony Danza show, JAG, and the acclaimed 2000s run of Battlestar Galactica. After that, he slowed down on acting yet again, but this time to focus on a career in visual arts, working mainly with paper collages. He is survived by his wife, Joy, and their two children, Austin and Sophie. Yeah, this was sad. I actually kind of saw, I saw this on, I think, Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, exploded with it yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he was a great actor. Mm-hmm. Loved him in Quantum Leap. Yeah. Loved and that's him. where, it, it's funny, because people of our generation, that's where we really yeah. know him from. And it was funny how many people were talking about, oh, my God, I used to watch that all the time. You know, it was that show where... It, Again, you know, our our age group where we were watching it with our families, you know, you didn't have a lot of, you know, you had maybe one television in your in your house and whatever somebody was watching, that's what you all watched. And he was such a likable character on it. And that's where a lot of people, you know, first saw him where he had been acting again since he was seven, yeah. you know. So by the time, you know, he became the TV actor, you know. He was almost ready to, yeah. to really retire yeah. well, from after it, you that, know? he was in Battlestar Galactic. Mm-hmm. He was great in that. Yep. And I loved him in Air Force One with Harrison Ford. Mm-hmm. He was great in that. I think he was a Secretary of Defense in that. Um, but you know, it's a shame. 85, good year, good mm-hmm. career. Yeah. And it was um, natural causes. So. Yeah. So he, yeah. he led a good life. Yeah, so. absolutely. That was it for our entertainment news this week. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick this week is a show, uh, one of the new shows that is on NBC. Um, And I have to admit, when I first saw the commercials for it, I was like, really? This is it? And I wasn't actually going to start watching it until a friend of mine uh, had started watching it. And she's like, you know, this kind of reminds me of the show Under the Dome. You'd probably like it. So I gave it a try. And that show is La Brea. Uh, So when a massive sinkhole opens in the middle of Los Angeles at the site of the La Brea Tar Pits and Wilshire Boulevard, hundreds of people and buildings are pulled into its depths. The survivors find themselves trapped in a mysterious and dangerous uh, uh, land where they must band together to survive. The show follows one family, uh, father, mother, son, and daughter, who are separated by the events and attempted to reunite. The father has visions that provide glimpses of when and where his wife and son are, and the sinkholes and the sudden appearance of this other group of people has the uh, attracted the attention of the United States Department of Homeland Security, who are studying a similar event that happened in the Mojave Desert. So it's it has a lot of um, like government conspiracy theories, like they know something's going on, but not really sure. And it's kind of like I, I honestly I don't see it going more than one season because I don't know where they can go with it, but it's an interesting concept that, you know, they kind of fell through almost like a wormhole. So they know they've realized that they've, they're still in Los Angeles, but they're just in, you know, millions of years before, you know, humans have, have arrived, but they're not the first people to fall into this because there's another tribe that they've, found and they speak English so they've been there for a number of years so it's kind of like how many years does this happen so kind of interesting again I don't know where it's gonna go after the one season so it'll be interesting to to see but you know if you if you watched under the dome and and that kind of concept of 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 government knowing something but not telling everybody give it a shot Okay, interesting pick. Thank you. So my pick this week uh, is another documentary called Third Eye Spies on Amazon Prime Video. 
For more than 20 years, the CIA studied psychic abilities for use in their top-secret spy program. With previously classified details about ESP now finally coming to light, there can be no more secrets. Two physicists discover psychic abilities are real, only to have their experiments at Stanford co-opted by the CIA and the research silenced by the demands of secrecy. Yet, as both, of the, as both these remote viewers and the audience learn, the more you hide something, the more it shines like a beacon in psychic space, and this ancient truth can no longer be suppressed. The true story of Russell Targ and America's Cold War psychic spies disclosed and declassified for the first time, with evidence presented by a Nobel laureate, an Apollo astronaut, and the military and scientific community that has been suppressed for nearly 30 years now able to speak for the first time. Targ's understated mantra that the evidence for extrasensory perception is overwhelming and shows a talent we all share and deserve to know about leaves us not just with a greater understanding of this unique chapter in U.S. history, but perhaps the most importantly and most important and greater understanding of who we are and our larger connection to the world. The CIA, NSA, and DIA used it. Your tax dollars paid for it, and now you deserve to know about it. That's the tagline. This documentary might just be enough to turn the non-believer into a disciple of ESP. Through a collection of interviews, stock footage, and recently revealed documents, it tells a compelling story. While the evidence provided for these remote viewing powers is historical, and there's no contemporary demonstrations of such phenomenon in the program, the viewer must trust the information presented here in order to buy into the reality of whether ESP exists or not. However, there's ample evidence presented here to suggest that the United States government not only believed in ESP, they invested heavily in it. I'm not sure I'm 100% on board with everything in the documentary. They provide a compelling story, and if nothing else, it makes for a great Cold War thriller, the likes of a Tom Clancy novel. But they started to lose me when they interviewed Yuri Geller as a purported psychic agent of the Israeli government. Geller, if you don't already know, is a somewhat well-known illusionist, a magician, and a television personality who claims to be psychic. He's famous, or perhaps infamous, for his spoon-bending illusions, which have already been debunked as just simple conjuring and sleight-of-hand tricks. Up until Geller appeared in the program, it seemed to have some legitimate weight, assuming you could believe what they were presenting. Sadly, the Geller arrival kind of killed the possibility of realism for me. But don't let that dissuade you. If nothing else, the program made for an interesting story, uh, and it was kind of almost a scientific presentation of how these types of studies have been done in the past. Whether or not everything is 100% true in the documentary or not, uh, there, the program is at least intelligent enough to leave that up to the viewer and not make any claims that it can't back up, which you know left me at least respecting the director, the producer's perspective on things. But that's my pick this week, Third Eye Spies on Amazon Prime. And we'll be right back with our afterthoughts. So we have a dwindling list here of afterthoughts as the convention season comes to an end. Right, we but have? we're getting ready for holiday light season, so maybe we'll throw some of that That's stuff true. in, you know, for, for next time. So uh, both of these events happen to be on the same day. So if you are in either of these areas, um, you're going to have to pick 
know which one to go to. You can't go to both. Choice is choice. So first is the Ocean City Comic Con, which will be on Saturday, December 11th from 10 to 5. And that is in Ocean City, Maryland at the uh, Roland Powell Convention Center. Which we actually plan to be at. Uh, yes, we will be going to that one. Uh, and if you are not in that area, but near Allentown, Pennsylvania, there is the Pennsylvania Toy and Comic Super Show, which will also be on December 11th from 10 to 2 at the South Mall Allentown in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Awesome. Well, I think that's all we had, but before we do go, I would once again invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as insights into entertainment video versions. As always can be listed as insights into things for all the networks podcasts. We're available on Apple podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, Buzzsprout, Podbean, Stitcher, Castro, Pandora, and pretty much any place you can get a podcast. I would also uh, invite you to give us your feedback. Give us your list of shows that you'd like us to plug here and tell us how we're doing. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com backslash insights underscore things. We do stream on Twitch five days a week at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. You can find video versions of this podcast listed as podcast.insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. We're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And for links to all of our uh, things that we have mentioned, you can go to our official website, which is insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,